about God, and even though we can't know except by the Holy Spirit about God, yet the mind is never better employed than when it is seeking to know this great God Almighty. And if even the imperfect knowledge that you and I can have of our Father, which art in heaven, raises us to such rapture, and satisfies so deeply the roots of our being, then what must it be in that day when we look on his face? What will it be in the day when we no longer depend upon our minds, but when with pioneer eyes of our souls we look without mediation upon the face of God himself? Wonderful! It's good to get acquainted with God now, so that at the end of time you won't be embarrassed in His presence. I'd like to point out something here. Everything that is true of God is true of the three persons of the Trinity. Did you know that there was a time when the idea of Jesus being God, being truly God, was believed by one branch of the church, but not by another? A man named Arius came along and began to teach that Jesus was a good man, a superior man, but he wasn't God. And the leaders of the church met together, a council, they called it. They studied the issue, and they gave us the Athanasian Creed. Here's what they arrived at, and I'll never get over thanking God for these wonderful, learned, godly men. They said, We worship one God in Trinity, and Trinity in unity. I'm a Unitarian in that I believe in the unity of God. I'm a Trinitarian in that I believe in the Trinity of God and they're not contrary one to the other. We worship one God in Trinity and Trinity in unity, neither confounding the persons nor dividing the substance. For there is one person of the Father, another of the Son, and another of the Holy Spirit. But the Godhead of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit is all one, the glory equal, the majesty co-eternal. I don't know whether you'll agree with me or not, but to me it is just like music to hear these old, godly, serious-minded church fathers set this out for all the ages. For the last sixteen hundred years the church has feasted on this. Such as the Father is, such is the Son, and such is the Holy Spirit. The Father uncreated, the Son uncreated, and the Holy Spirit uncreated. The Father incomprehensible, the Son incomprehensible, and the Holy Spirit incomprehensible the Father eternal, the Son eternal, and the Holy Spirit eternal. Yet there are not three eternals, but one eternal, as also there are not three uncreated, nor three incomprehensible, but one uncreated and one incomprehensible. So also the Father is almighty, the Son almighty, and the Holy Spirit almighty. Yet there are not three almighties, but one almighty. So the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Spirit is God, and yet they are not three gods, but one God. Now that's what we believe, my brethren. We believe in the three persons, but one God. The three persons are three, but the one God is one, and this we believe. So when I talk about God, I mean the three persons of the Trinity. You can't separate them, not dividing the substance said these old fathers. You can't have God the Father except you have God the Son. You can't have God the Spirit unless you have the Father and the Son, for the Spirit proceedeth from the Father and the Son. So when I'm talking about God, I'm talking about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, not confusing their persons, for there are three persons. But everything that is true of the Father is true of the Son and the Holy Spirit, and everything that is true of the Son and the Holy Spirit is true of the Father. Let's get that settled before we go any further. Self-existent selfhood God is self-existent selfhood. Novation, the church father, said, God has no origin. Just those four words, God has no origin, would be an education to the average person. Origin, you see, is a creature word. Everything came from somewhere. One of the questions that every child asks is, Where did I come from? Then you have a job on your hands. It won't be enough to tell him he came from Jesus, because when he gets a little older he'll say, How did I come from Jesus? Everything has an origin. When you hear a bird sing, you know that once that bird was packed in a tiny little egg. It came from somewhere. It came from an egg. Where did the egg come from? It came from another little bird. 
and that bird came from another little egg, and that egg came from another bird, and so on, back, back, back to the heart of God, when God said, Let the heavens bring forth, let the earth bring forth, let the dry land appear, as it says in Genesis chapter 1. Origin is a creature word. The trees had an origin, space had an origin, the mountains, the seas, all things have an origin. But when you come back to God, you come back to the one who has no origin. He is the cause of all things, the uncaused cause. Everything is a cause and effect. For instance, a man walking down the street with his little boy is the cause of the little boy. But the man is also an effect. He was caused by someone else, his father. It's cause and effect, cause and effect, down through the years until you come to the cause that is the cause of all causes, God. God is the uncaused cause of everything. He is the origin that had no origin. This same Athanasian creed says, The Father is made of none, neither created nor begotten. The Son is of the Father alone, not made nor created but begotten. The Holy Spirit is of the Father and of the Son, neither made nor created nor begotten but proceeding. I want to think, pray, study and meditate on God and get to learn the language of the place where I am going. I am going up there where the Father is and the Son and the Holy Spirit. All the great company of the redeemed is there, the blood-washed, the regenerated, the sanctified. And when I get there I want to be able to speak the language of that place without an American accent. I want to know the language of the place where I am going, and the origin of that language, the origin of heaven itself, is God. God himself has no origin, but he is the originator of everything else. He is the uncaused cause of everything. God is the original, the I am that I am. The verb to be, as in I am, is the Latin root of the word essence. God is the original, uncreated essence. God is not derived from anything. Everyone is derived from someone else, and everything is derived from some other thing. But when it comes to God, God is underived, uncreated. If God had derived from something else, then that something else would have antedated God. That's why one of the silliest expressions that was ever used in all the wide world is to say that Mary is the mother of God. How could Mary be the mother of God when God is the original essence? Mary wasn't back there before God was. She's the mother of the body of Jesus, and she's nothing more than that. It was in the holy womb of the Virgin Mary that the great God Almighty compressed himself into the form of a babe, and so we honor her and respect her highly, for she's blessed among women as the one that God used as the channel to come into this world of ours. But before Mary was... God was, and before Abraham was, God was, and before Adam was, God was. And before the world was, the stars, the mountains, the seas, the rivers, the plains, or the forests, God was. And God is, and God will ever be. God is the originating self. God's selfhood is his holy being, his unsupported, independent existence. God's Selfhood and Prayer Did you ever think about God without getting down on your knees and begging for something? Most of us, when we pray, we bring our grocery list and say, Lord, we'd like this and this and this. We act as if we were running to the corner store to get something. And God has been dragged down in our thinking to nothing more than the one who gives us what we want when we're in trouble. Now God does give us what we want. He's a good God. God's goodness is one of his attributes. But I hope that we'll not imagine that God exists simply to answer the prayers of people. A businessman wants to get a contract, so he goes to God and says, God, give me. A student wants to get a good grade, so she goes to God and says, give me. A young man wants the girl to say yes, so he gets on his knees and says, Father, give her to me. We just use God as a kind of source of getting what we want. Our Heavenly Father is very, very kind, and He tells us that we are to ask. Whatever we ask in the name of His Son, He'll give us, if it's within the confines of His will. And His will is as broad as the whole world. Still, we must think of God as the Holy One, not just as the One from whom we can get things. 
God is not a glorified Santa Claus who gives us everything we want, then fades out and lets us run our own way. He gives, but in giving he gives us himself, too. And the best gift God ever gives us is himself. He gives answers to prayer, but after we've used up the answer or don't need it anymore, we still have God. In God's self there is no sin. We creatures properly and rightly and scripturally have everything to say against self and selfishness. It's the great sin. But God's self is not sinful because God was the originator of us all, and it is only our fallen selves that are sinful. Because God is the original unfallen holy God, God's self is not sinful. The poet says, In thy praise of self untiring, thy perfections shine. Self-sufficient, self-admiring, such life must be thine. Glorifying self, yet blameless, with a sanctity all shameless, it is so divine. God loves himself, the Father loves the Son, the Son loves the Father, and the Son and the Father love the Holy Spirit. They understood this in the olden times, when men were thinkers instead of imitators, and they thought within the confines of the Bible. Incidentally, in discussing God's attributes, I am not trying to think my way up to God. You can't think your way up to God any more than you can climb a ladder to the moon. You can't think your way into the kingdom of heaven. You go in by faith. But after you're in, you can think about the kingdom of heaven. You can't think your way to England, but after you get there, you can think about England. So God loves himself, and he loves himself because he is the God who originated love. He is the I Am of love, the essence of all holiness, and the fountain of all self-conscious light. The words I and I Am always refer to the self. I knew a dear old brother, God bless him, he's in heaven now, and he'll wear a crown so big that it'll come down over my shoulders, I'm sure. He'd been a missionary to China, and he didn't believe much in saying I. He knew that I meant self, and a fallen self is a sinful thing. So he would always say one. And he'd say things like, when one was in China, one said this, and one did this. He meant himself. He was afraid to say I. I suppose if he'd been writing Psalm 23, he'd make it read like this, The Lord is one's shepherd, one shall not want. There's nothing wrong with saying I or I am, but when you say I am, you always put am in lowercase letters. But when God said I am, he put it in capitals. There's a difference. When God says I am, it means he did not derive from anywhere. He started the whole business. He is God. But when I say I am, I'm a little echo of God. I believe that God is very, very proud of his children. I believe that throughout the vast reaches of this universe, God is happy to call his people his people. Do you remember what God said about Job? The sons of God, the angels, were all passing in parade, and who comes with them but Satan himself? the brass, the arrogance that he had, traveling along with the unfallen sons of God. And when he got out before the reviewing stand, God said, Have you seen my servant Job? He is a good man and eschews evil. Have you seen my servant Job? See Job chapter 1 verse 8. He was proud of Job. God is proud of his people, and he's proud to have us say, I am in a little echo voice because he is the original voice who said, I am that I am. The doctrine of man made in the image of God is one of the basic doctrines of the Bible, and one of the most elevating, enlarging, magnanimous, and glorious doctrines that I know of. There's nothing wrong with self-respect. There's nothing wrong with saying, I am, and I will, and I do, as long as we remember we're saying it in lowercase letters, as an echo from the original one who first said, I am. Strange, isn't it, that God the Son was called the Word, and God enabled man to speak? And he enabled no other creature to speak. Not the finest bred dog can talk, not the finest minor bird. They're supposed to talk, but they don't know what they're saying. Man alone can talk, because only man has this thing we call the Logos, the Word. The essence of sin is independent self. 
You see, God sat on the throne, the I am, and along came man and said, I will, and sought to rise above the throne of God. He disobeyed God and took the bit in his own teeth and became a little God in his own right. The sinful world says, I am forgetting that they are an echo of the one above and saying it in their own right. Mussolini said, I will make my life a masterpiece. What a masterpiece he was, that big, bloated, arrogant gorilla. And now he lies rotting in the clay and the worms are feasting on the man who used to stand on a balcony and make big, noisy, bombastic speeches. That is what sin is. The definition of sin is fallen selfhood. God made us to be like planets. Around and around they go, held by the magnetic attraction of the sun. In the same way, God is the great Son of Righteousness, Malachi chapter 4, verse 2. And around him, warmed and healed and blessed and lighted by his holy person, all his creatures move, all the seraphim, cherubim, angels, archangels, children of God and watchers in the skies. And best of all was man, made in his own image. We revolved around God as a planet around its sun. Then one day the little planet said, I will be my own son, away with this God. And man fell. That's what we call the fall of man. That's where sin came in. Sin reached up and took God's self and said, I'll be self myself. And God was ruled out. As the holy apostle said, they did not like to have God in their minds, therefore God gave them over to vile affections. Romans chapter 1 verse 26. All the evil that the police, educators, doctors, and psychiatrists are worried about now, deviancy, sodomy, exhibitionism, and all the rest, all came as a result of man not wanting to have this God in his mind or in his heart, not recognizing him as being God. He went out on his own to be his own little God. Isn't that the way the average sinner acts? He's his own little God. He's the Son. He puts himself in capital letters and forgets that there's anybody up there that'll judge him. Sin has symptoms and manifestations, just as cancer has certain manifestations. I've seen a few cancer victims in my time. My own father died of cancer. They have symptoms, but the symptoms are not the cancer. If you clear up the symptoms, you still have the cancer. Sin also has manifestations, many manifestations. Paul gives a list of them in Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 through 21. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. And yet he didn't tell us sin at all. He told us the symptoms of sin. These things are all symptoms of something deeper, our asserting self. It is asserting my created and derived self, putting myself on the throne and saying, I am self, I am that I am. I have read books on existentialism. I could shudder and grieve that men can be so tragically mistaken as they are, and yet I knew they were because I read my Bible. Existentialists say that man is... Man wasn't created, man just is, and he has to start from there. He has no creator, no planner, nobody that thought him out. He just is. They make man say what only God can say, I am that I am. Man can say in a modest, humble voice, I am, but only God can say in capital letters, I am that I am. Man has forgotten that, and that is sin. It is not your temper that is sin. It's something deeper than your temper. It is not your lust that is sin. It's something deeper than that. That's but a symptom. All the crime in the world, all the evil, the robberies, the rapes, the desertions, the assassinations, they're but the external manifestations of an inward disease, sin. And yet it is not to be thought of as a disease so much as an attitude, a derangement. There sat God upon his throne, the I am that I am, the eternal self-sufficient, self-existent one. He made man to be like him and gave him a will. He said, man can do as he pleases. He meant for man to circle around the throne of God as the planets circle around the sun. 
and I repeat, man said, I am that I am. He turned away from God, and fallen self took over. No matter how many manifestations sin may have, remember that the liquid essence in the bottle is always self. That's why it's not always easy to get people to become real Christians. You can get them to sign a card or make a decision or join a church or something like that. But to get people delivered from their sin is a pretty hard deal because it means that I've got to get off that throne. God belongs on that throne, but sin has pushed God off and taken over. Can you imagine it? The great God Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, said, This is my name throughout all generations, my memorial forever. I am that I am. I never was created. I was not made. I am. I made you for my love. I made you to worship, honor, and glorify me. I made you to love you and hold you and give myself to you. But you turned away from me, and you made yourself God, and you put yourself on that throne. That is sin. That's why the scripture says, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. John chapter 3, verse 3. What does born again mean? Among other things, it means a renewal, a rebirth. But it also means getting off the throne and putting God on it. It means that the self-existent one is recognized for who he is. Reverently and humbly I kneel before his Son, who died and rose and lives and pleads, and I say, O oh, Lord Jesus, I give up. I am no longer going to sit on the throne and run my own life. I am no longer going to trust in my own righteousness, which is only a filthy rag. I am no longer going to believe in my good works or in my religious activities. I am going to trust Thee, the God of grace, the God who gave Thy Son to die. And so the new birth takes place, and I trust the Lord Jesus Christ, the man in the glory, my Savior and Lord. And thus I am saved. Long ago there was one by the name of Lucifer, to whom God gave a position higher than any other creature, at the very throne of God. One day pride took over, and he said, I will arise, I will set my throne above God's throne. And he became proud, and God cast him down. See Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12 through 14. That's the devil. And it is the devil who is leading the world now, the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2. Right out there among the leaders of society, our politicians, our literary men, and all the rest. This is true not only in North America, but all over the world from the day Adam sinned. We're guilty of offending His Majesty, of insulting the royalty that sits upon the eternal uncreated throne. We're guilty of sacrilegious rebellion. It isn't as if you're doing Jesus Christ a favor by coming forward and signing a card with a big grin. It's a matter of realizing that you've been occupying a stolen throne, one that belongs to Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father. You've been saying, I am that I am, in capital letters, when you should say meekly and reverently, O oh God, I am because Thou art. That's what the new birth means. It means repentance and faith. So what is God like? God is not like anything you know, in that God is self-existent and nothing else is. Before the hills in order stood, or earth received her frame, from everlasting thou art God, to endless years the same. When heaven and earth were yet unmade, when time was yet unknown, thou in thy bliss and majesty didst live and love alone. Thou wert not born, there was no fount from which thy being flowed, there is no end which thou canst reach, but thou art simply God. Our Father in heaven, thou art God, and thy name is I am that I am forever. In thy loving kindness thou hast created me, but I have sinned. All we like sheep have gone astray. That's the essence of sin. We have all turned to our own way, and our own way will end in hell. And our Lord said, If any man follow me, let him deny himself. Father, I recognize thy right to run my business, thy right to run my home, thy right to guide my life, thy right to be all in all to me. Not I, but Christ be honored, loved, exalted. 
Not I, but Christ be seen, be heard, be known. Not I, but Christ. Chapter 2 God's Transcendence Thine, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. For all that is in the heaven and in the earth is thine. Thine is the kingdom, O Lord, and thou art exalted as head above all. 1 Chronicles chapter 29, verse 11 Canst thou by searching find out God? Canst thou find out the Almighty unto perfection? It is as high as heaven. What canst thou do? Deeper than hell. What canst thou know? Job chapter 11, verses 7 through 8 Lo, these are parts of his ways, but how little a portion is heard of him! But the thunder of his power, who can understand? Job chapter 26, verse 14 Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. Psalm 145, verse 3 For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Isaiah chapter 55, verses 8 through 9. Who only hath immortality, dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto? Whom no man hath seen, nor can see. To whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 16. The term divine transcendence may sound like something that takes a lot of learning or at least a lot of profound thinking to understand, but it doesn't. Transcend simply means to go above, to rise above, to be above. Of course, it's very difficult to think of God as transcendent and also as imminent or omnipresent at the same time. It is difficult to understand how He can be here with us, in us, pervading all things, but at the same time transcending all things. It looks like a contradiction, but as with many other apparent contradictions, it's not at all contradictory. The two thoughts are entirely in accord with each other. God is always nearer than you may imagine Him to be. God is so near that your thoughts are not as near as God. Your breath is not as near as God. Your very soul is not as near to you as God is. And yet God, because He is God, His uncreated being is so far above us that no thought can conceive it, nor words express it. I want to make it very clear that when I say far above, I do not mean geographically or astronomically removed. It's an analogy. Because we are human beings and live in this world, we learn to speak by analogy. Almost everything we say is by analogy. Everybody's a poet and doesn't know it, as the saying goes. A poet is someone who speaks by analogies, who sees eternity in an hour and the world in a grain of sand. You and I are always thinking and speaking in analogies. When we say that a man is straight, we are comparing the man with a ruler. When we say that the ruler is a foot long, we are comparing it with a man's foot. We say a man is off base, that's from baseball. We say that he's going down for the count, that's from boxing. We say he put all his cards on the table. That's from gambling. Almost everything we say is an analogy taken from the world around us. Every phase of life gives us tools to think with. So when we say that God is far above, we're using an analogy. We're thinking about a star that's way above, way out yonder in space. But that isn't what we really mean when we think about the transcendent God. If you miss this point, you might as well stop reading because this is critical to understanding what follows. When we say that God's transcendence is farness above, we are not thinking about astronomical distances or physical magnitude. God never thinks about the size of anything because God contains everything. He never thinks about distance because God is everywhere. He doesn't have to go from one place to another, so distance doesn't mean anything to Him. We humans use these expressions to help us to think. They're analogies and illustrations. Imagine, if you will, a child that gets lost in the mountains. 
The family is out having a picnic, and the little one wanders off and disappears. So they send out search parties and bloodhounds, everything they can do to find that little child. She's only a little tyke, maybe two years.